Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. On today's episode, we'll visit the Medgar Evers College swim team, dive into virtual reality at Lehman College, meet a Holocaust survivor who tells his story to a student at Queensborough Community College, and so much more. But first, CUNY has partnered with New Yorkers for Children to help kids from foster care pursue their education. In 2006, the Guardian Scholars Program was born, which we recently renamed Nick Scholars after our founder, uh, Nicholas Capetta, who was the first uh, commissioner of ACS. It started out at Hunter College, and it expanded to four uh, CUNY colleges. They get up to five years of tuition from New Yorkers for Children. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I was introduced to foster care about 10 years old after my father passed away. So me and my sister like bounced from different group homes, homes to homes. One of the biggest challenges of being in foster care while going to school is probably not being stable with like a family and not being um, stable financially. A lot of pressure on you. We offer what's called a back to school package program. For freshmen, they get brand new computers and then they get throughout their lifetime at college, Amazon gift cards and Metro cards. And then our third scholarship program is called the Evans Emergency Fund. We've done housing, we've done medical issues. And so the combination of those three scholarship programs is sort of our signature programs. I definitely was going down the wrong path. At some point, I completely gave up on education and I feel like a college degree like wouldn't help me out in the long run until I see my sister graduate from this very school. So that's what motivated me to enroll in college. She was a Guardian Scholar and she informed me about the program. It made me proud, so I also wanted that for myself. We focus on older youth because we understand that if they aren't on a path to go to college, um, many of these other issues could come up around homelessness, around unemployment. The financial support is critical, but beyond that, the emotional support and a place to come to. I mean, we're an office centrally located. Youth can come into our offices at any time, and they do. Each uh, youth in our program does connect with a youth academic advisor. We meet once a month and can sort of share more personal challenges that they may be having. We have partnerships with A-list tutoring. So for example, if a young person comes into our offices and says, you know what, I'm really struggling with my calculus class, um, we will pay for them to get tutoring. Um, it's not uncommon for a young person to come in and suffer from depression, um, which will impact their ability to study. It would be at that point that um, we'd make a referral to a home within, which is our um, mental health uh, practitioner who could give more targeted services. We have a youth advisory board that's comprised and led by youth uh, that are in foster care. It has a president, a vice president, and they meet once a month at our offices. And they're the individuals that we go to first when we say, we're gonna start this program, what do you think? Or what do you think the field needs? You know, similarly to the success of a student, it's, it's within them, that drive, and we're just trying to make it a little bit easier. Well, going back to school has been one of the best things I've done. I, um, the networking here, just meeting new people from diverse backgrounds, and I'm doing pretty well, all A's and B's. Right now I'm studying media technology, and when I transfer, I plan on studying the same thing at City College. They have a um, wonderful program called Sonic Arts that I'm in, um, interested in, that my advisor informed me about. There's such a link between somebody's ability to kind of get a degree, um, especially, you know, earn that degree and succeed, you know, in a career. There's a huge connection. 90% of our youth graduate college, which goes to show you that if you provide the combination of financial and emotional support to youth, they will graduate. Any young kid that's in foster care that probably is discouraged, I, I feel like they shouldn't be. Stay motivated and never give up on yourself and don't feel like an alien because you're in foster care because that's something I struggled with as a child. It was a little embarrassing for me. I used to try to hide it, but not knowing all along I was eligible for a lot of resources, I would definitely tell them to take advantage of everything they're eligible for. 
and use their story to motivate themselves and others. Don't let it defeat you. The Baruch College Traders Club trains young finance students in the world of business and that preparation has enabled them to win the largest trading competition in the country. In Baruch, a lot of the theoretical knowledge is given to you, a lot of the um, background, the formulas, all the theory is uh, taught to you, but you don't really feel a practical application for it until you join some sort of club, and this club is incredible in terms of uh, cementing the knowledge that you learn in class with actual practical applications. The Baruch Traders Club has a lot of different students. They come from all different majors here. I introduce some um, entry-level trading simulations will have various competitions on them. Usually I'll leave it up to the students to try to figure out you know what to do on their own before you know revealing the answer and I let them play against each other which they love to do because you know they all are very competitive. So we have internal competitions where um, we try to find the best traders and those people usually are the ones that get to go to the uh, actual trading competitions. We would constantly compete against each other to see who's the best. Um, I would like whatever I would find any like tricks or something I would teach the other teams and make sure they were better. Making the other teams better um, would make it like more difficult for like me to, like, to beat them. That kind of pushed me to work even harder. It's a lot of just preparation and just having the right mentality and just having the initiative to just take time out of your day and just like practice and practice and practice. At, at MIT, um, yeah, you needed to have um, somebody that could set up the code to interface with the trading platform um, and then you know, somebody that also knew the theoretical material very well. Our students need to develop a strategy that will be sort of most profitable in most situations. And then on average, um, you know, they'll outperform their competitors. The basis of finance is essentially the trade-off between risk and reward. So with this in mind, in order to make a lot of money, you have to take a certain amount of risk. But the most important thing is traders are able to take the most uh, I guess, intelligent risk. So when they see a possibility of making money with, I guess, limited downside, they will take that opportunity because they think that that's the best way for them to position themselves and to capitalize on the opportunity. Uh, low risk, high reward. We were basically trying to take advantage of small um, mispricings in the market and not bet in any certain direction because we found it too risky to try and build a position like predicting that the stock will go up or down. It was better to just find out if the stock was mispriced in the moment, take advantage of it, and when the mispricing cleared up, we got out. Again, during the competition, it's very exciting. It's, there's a lot of energy. Your fingers are going to want to click, and you're going to want to react. But if you manage to stick to the strategy, apparently, or at least for our students, that was the key to success. There were about 40-something, almost 50 teams, um, mostly from Ivy Leagues, um, with the addition of uh, Baruch, uh, MIU Stern, as well as, I think, like Boston College. So it's a, an elite competition. Uh, most importantly, um, the sponsors are the top proprietary training firms in Chicago and New York. And that makes the competition unique, because the students know that at the end of the road, there are real career opportunities. We all want to succeed, so we all talked about the optimal strategies and we all built, uh, we all worked together on building the support sheets to make a successful effort. The small differences that came at the end were uh, how we as individuals traded. And that was a huge part in why we were able to do so well and just 
to be able to keep our cool just because like we had something to refer back to and we didn't have to think too much about oh like should we take more risks now because we're not doing well it didn't make sense to do that because we trusted in our preparation and all the time we put in beforehand and we knew that it was going to pay off and it did No real money actually changes hands. It's all about the art of the deal. Queensborough Community College has been using the lessons learned from the Holocaust to teach current and future generations about anti-Semitism. Our Barry Mitchell has a story, and we want to warn some viewers that it may be difficult to watch. They sent us all to Auschwitz, and we had to stay there naked. It was in Nepal, it was very cold. Recently, my neighborhood pharmacist said to me, see that elderly gentleman, he would make a good interview. But I realized I needed some guidance. My name is Dr. Dan Lesham, and I'm the director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center here at Queensborough Community College. The mission of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center is to educate current and future generations using the lessons of the Holocaust and other genocide about the dangers of unbridled prejudice, uh, hatred, and bigotry. The Holocaust was the planned annihilation of nearly six million European Jews by the German Nazi government led by Adolf Hitler and their collaborators between 1939 and 1945. My name is Marissa Hollywood. I'm the assistant director here at the Kufferberg Holocaust Center. Over the last seven semesters, I've led the Holocaust Fellowship Program. We offer it to anyone across the campus. I've had many students that are new to this country, and we'll get students from all different disciplines. The goal of the course is, of course, to give a background on what the Holocaust was, how did it happen, who were the players, all of those facts and numbers and statistics. The most important aspect of this program is them interviewing an actual Holocaust survivor. For which volunteers are carefully trained, and one student offered to interview my neighbor for me. She studies nursing. My name is Luce Davis, and I'm a student here at Queensboro Community College. I'm nervous, but more excited, and also feel privileged. Today I will be interviewing Holocaust survivor Mr. Martin Braun at his home in Queens, New York. Where were you born? St. Siglo, Poland. They rounded up my father and I went to the attic. How many from the people from your hometown survived, do you Nobody. know? Nobody. The Nazis found Martin Braun, who spent the next few years in concentration camps. 13-year-old Martin's life was now forced labor, sadistic guards, and starvation. Food, we only got a potato skin with the skin in the morning. No food. Resourcefulness and quick thinking kept him alive, once by pretending to be German. We were about 15 boys now with a bombed out house. We were hiding there. And we put on the, the we took off the German, the dead bodies, the, the civilian clothes, and we stayed there in, the, in, the, in, that, uh, in that house. The civilian police surrounded that house and says, everybody out. And they lined us up, said, who speaks Jew, uh, uh, German? So I stepped out, I speak German. And another guy, two boys also, they spoke German, they lined us up. And the other one, they took out a pistol and he shot them. My name is Olivia Tercy. I'm a counselor here at Queensborough Community College. I am here to work with students who will be uh, interviewing Holocaust survivors and to advise them on symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder that are prevalent in many survivors of the Holocaust. These symptoms are not something that, that tends to go away very quickly or tends to end when the traumatic event ends. They are things that people struggle with for the rest of their lives. Tanks came out from the forest toward us and the Russians start yelling, Americani, Americani. <laughs> we, were, we were liberated. My husband is a big history buff, and when I was preparing the questions, he said, maybe you can ask him, do you see history repeating itself? They should remember that this can happen again if you were not aware of what was going on then. 
Until about a year ago, I would have students ask me, when was anti-Semitism abolished in the United States? To them, anti-Semitism seemed like something that only existed in the history books or on the History Channel. We strive to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate our students about the world around them today. We find ourselves more and more using contemporary examples to make the lessons of the Holocaust come alive. He's a testimony of the hand of God was on him. And, and as a result, look at this beautiful, beautiful family he blessed you with. That's revenge. That's revenge. Students see the survivors as people. They're not just victims of the Holocaust. They're not just survivors. They're people, it could have been their grandparents. It could have been them. Learn their story and share it. Barry Mitchell, study with the best. The swimming pool at Medgar Evers College isn't new, but the way they're using it for their central Brooklyn community is. I'm Ari Goldberg. Behind me, you are watching the women's varsity swim team practicing right here at Medgar Evers College. They were saying this is the very first time they've had a swim team in Medgar Evers. Yeah. So that's the history. You guys are wow. the very first members of the swim team of the entire college. <laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> History's being made for us. <laughs> Medgar Evers has 13 other varsity sports, but for the very first time, swimming is being offered as the 14th. We are in central Brooklyn. Central Brooklyn, I would say uh, it's the, the minorities. Uh, it's about 80% minorities. Yeah. A lot of our students here at Medgar and in the community never, knew, never grew up learning how to swim. So swimming to me is a highbrow sport. You have to, there's, there's lessons. Swimming lessons cost money. And would you rather put food on your table or send your child to swimming lessons? So that's why we have these programs and that's why we're starting this varsity swim team to show people that it's not just the color of the skin or, or where you grew up. You could do whatever you possibly want to do. Of course, the demographics of the Medgar Evers neighborhood have been largely consistent since its founding. So why only make a swim team now? Well, the pool has been open after the renovation for about five and a half years. So we just felt like this was the greatest opportunity for us to start the women's swimming team. And then also we hired uh, Shatara Murphy, who's our director of aquatics. We hired her two and a half years ago. So she's really been the push behind us starting a women's swim team population is about 70 percent women so we wanted to give our young ladies an opportunity to participate in another sport and with a lovely facility like this women swimming seemed to be the ideal choice it's an impressive undertaking and her passion at each step is palpable for one Murphy is teaching many of the students to swim in the first place and on top of that as a coach for a prospective NCAA team she's trying to build up her team to meet NCAA compliance we have about five to seven Five to seven girls right now, we're still working on our numbers, but we're more than positive that we'll have the numbers. It takes eight, that's, that's the compliance number, but when you have a women's swim team, you want, you want double that number, maybe even triple that number. I also teach learn to swim lessons here as well, because I, our, we have a huge population of students staff and faculty who want to learn how to swim. Indeed, the increased exposure from the team means all the more exposure to swimming for the community. More so now that Brooklyn-born Leah Neal has medaled in each of the last two Olympic Games. And Medgar Evers is happy to provide a place to learn. And that could mean a lot for Central Brooklyn. We are partnered with some organizations in the city that provide learn to swim programs uh, for kids and adults. And the college also offers through continuing education which is another arm of the college, uh, learn to swim classes. I think having us a women's varsity swim team here at Medgar Evers would be huge. It would be something different, especially women, especially African-American women on that chart of able swimmers in everyone else's mind. So the fact that we have a swim team here in central Brooklyn competing for Medgar Evers College, you know, Cougars, would be a, it, it would be a big deal. From the very first swim team ever at Medgar Evers College, 
I'm Ari Goldberg for Study with the Best. Lehman College is opening its first virtual reality training academy this spring, which is sure to keep CUNY on track with the ever-evolving tech world. Let's take a look. Okay, we're at the building. We're going in. Oh, we're getting a heat signature from the first floor. Yep, yeah, got it. We found someone. We've got a flash over at level three, guys. Uh, Lehman College is very much committed to expanding access to careers of the future. And so through a public-private partnership agreement with Eon Reality, which is one of the world's premier uh, virtual reality and augmented reality companies, we decided that it was uh, a good time to try to put together a virtual reality uh, training academy and development lab for Bronx students. Um, the idea being that we could uh, prepare uh, students for this new and exciting world of tech and do so in a way that would ensure the quality that uh, Lehman uh, students are, are accustomed to receiving. Hey Sam, do you think we can have these three outlets done by tomorrow? The program is open not only to CUNY or Lehman students but also to Bronx residents in general and people from the surrounding communities. The cost for CUNY students is $499 um, for an 11-month training program. The first three months will be focused on the theory behind augmented reality and virtual reality and the following eight months will be focused on actual development of uh, solutions based on this technology. Um, and there will be an entrepreneurial type of component to that as well to ensure that the projects that the students are working on are projects that will be uh, beneficial uh, in general uh, to the world. Uh, students that participate in this 11-month uh, training will work on animation, uh, 3D graphics, and web development, among other technologies. I'm a doctoral lecturer here at um, Lehman College in the Middle and High School Science Education Department. I also teach in the biology department. I'm interested in taking the training course because virtual reality has a lot of good implications with respect to education and specifically science education. Hello and welcome to this new anatomy lesson about the heart. Let's start with a bit of background. A lot of times science concepts are really difficult for students to understand because sometimes these concepts are very, very abstract in nature. So it's very hard for students to be able to understand things that they cannot see. And this new virtual reality technology will be able to give the students the ability to be able to do that, to be able to conceptualize science in a way that they're not currently able to do. Lehman College is very excited about the prospect of using uh, this uh, initiative that we have to not only educate people that will be able to enter the field, but also to do so in a way that will allow them to create applications that we can bring back into our own classrooms. An area of particular interest is in nursing. Can we develop applications that we can bring into our nursing program so our nurse practitioners will be able to, in a virtual, safe environment, uh, put into practice some of the things that they're learning in the classroom. When we look at where we stand with respect to the services we provide to the Bronx community and surrounding regions, we realize that the only way that we can continue to be a vehicle of upward mobility is if we provide access to the careers of the future. And those that provide an upper uh, middle class uh, shot at uh, upward mobility. As an engineer and as president of Lehman College, I'm really proud that we have a lead in this area. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, log on to our website at cuny.tv or check out our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.